All right, all right. We're being joined to worship on all of our campuses now. And uh, this week is the conclusion uh, to our series, God's Money. So uh, two messages in one. Uh, buckle up. Uh, that means we've got two videos. Here's the first one. Uh, come on, Dave Ramsey. Hey, Harvest Bible Chapel. This is Dave Ramsey again. I want to thank Pastor James McDonald for including me in his series on God's Money. Over the years, I've been able to talk to a lot of men and women, a lot of couples at different income levels and at all different levels of wealth. And I've met people making $150,000 a year who are flat broke, up to their eyeballs in debt. And I've met people making $50,000 a year who are debt free, have money in their 401k, they're building wealth, they have their emergency fund and they're winning with money. How is that possible? How can someone be winning at $50,000 while someone else is losing big time at $150,000? The answer may surprise you. I think I may have discovered one of the most powerful life-changing traits of the super successful. I think this one thing is so fundamental that it's impossible to be successful with money without understanding it. If you grasp this one concept, you can virtually have anything you want. You'll be able to give like you've never given. You'll be able to stay out of debt. You can literally be whoever you want to be. You can do whatever you want to do. You'll be able to save, invest, and give more than you ever thought possible. Your relationships, they'll be richer. They'll be deeper. This really is one of the most powerful financial principles I can think of. But most people don't know what it is anymore. They totally leave it out of their life and out of their plan. What am I talking about? What's this magical thing? Well, it's not magic at all. I'm talking about contentment. Contentment. Contentment goes hand in hand with godliness. The Bible says that godliness with contentment is great gain. This is a big deal spiritually. This is truly a hard issue. But most people don't understand contentment today. Some people think contentment means that you're apathy or you're lazy. You know, the world out there, it's addicted to bigger and better. So the idea of actually slowing down and enjoying what you have and giving before moving on to the next big thing, it's kind of a joke these days. You see, without contentment, your whole life will just be jumping from one thing to another, always hoping the next thing will be the thing that makes you happy. Well, that's just not going to happen. Things don't make you happy. And if you're wondering whether or not you have a contentment problem, here's a quick little test. See if any of these things describe you. Number one, you keep falling for get-rich-quick schemes. Number two, you go to great lengths to try to appear wealthy. Number three, you have anxiety about what you don't have. And number four, you struggle with jealousy and envy when you see other people winning instead of enjoying their successes. Those are four sure signs of discontentment. And they can wreck your life if you're not careful. Here's the deal. Contentment is not a destination. It's not a place you get to. It's a manner of traveling. It's an attitude that influences everything you do with money. If you leave it out of your plan, you'll never feel like you have enough of anything. And trust me, that's no way to live. All right, that's a good start. Let's open our Bibles to where the verse that he quoted, godliness with contentment is great gain is found, 1 Timothy 6. All right, go uh, toward the end of uh, Paul's epistles, and you'll find Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6. Uh, I think it's good to read the scriptures, and uh, let's uh, just follow along. As I'm going to read the whole chapter. Uh, you all right with that? I'm going to read the whole chapter. You all right with that? Here it comes. Here it comes. First Timothy 6 says, Let all who are under a yoke as slaves regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful. Lots of application here, of course, to employment. Those who have believing masters must not, be, must not be disrespectful on the grounds that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these things. 
If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment, for we brought nothing into this world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called, about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who is the, his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, who no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Seems like the end, but... He decided to add this under the inspiration of the Spirit. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Now, because this is the conclusion, and because I know not all of you have heard the entire series, and because we're not coming back here anytime soon, and because I know that we tend to forget, uh, turn to your neighbor and say, you forget things. <laughs> all right, all right, come, come on now. Um, we're just going to review a little bit uh, where we've been. So uh, here it is, uh, uh, God's money. Everyone say God's money. Uh, first this, uh, now many weeks ago, view it vertically. View it vertically. Uh, money is not good or bad. It's what you do with it. 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 It's not good or bad in and of itself. It's, I'm trying to remember, it's... It's what you do with it. Judas did wrong. He betrayed Jesus for money. And Joseph of Arimathea did right and bought him an honorable uh, place to be buried. Money's not good or bad. It's a test. It's a testimony. It's a tool. It's all God's. View it vertically. Spend less than you make. I feel like I could summarize the whole series. Spend less than you make. Amen. Spend less than you make. The end. Spending less than you make is the regular uh, exercise of financial fitness. If you want to have, be fit, how important is regular exercise? Very. Spending less than you make is the regular exercise of financial fitness. Okay? Consumer debt is the drunk driving of biblical stewardship. View it vertically. It's God's. You don't have a car, you don't have a house, you don't have a spouse, you don't have any kids. They all belong to God. Everything we have is God. Say amen. amen. That's what it means to be a steward. So view it vertically. Earn it honestly. Earn it honestly. Earn it honestly. Honest hard work for fair compensation assures that God will meet your needs. Okay? We spent a whole week on that. Proverbs 13, 11. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but he who gathers little by little will increase it. 
Time is so important. Some of you have been grieved by years and even decades lost. Start now. Repent and start now. Okay? Earn it honestly. Utilize it. View it vertically. Earn it honestly. And then uh, utilize it effectively. Our second son, uh, Landon, brought, bought an ice cream truck this week. <laughs> I don't think he wanted me to bring a picture of it, but I'm so impressed with that. He's a very hard worker. He is a saver, 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 saver. And he was so convicted by what he had just sitting there. He's always wanted, he's talked about it for five or six years. He always wanted to have an ice cream truck. So even though he has a full-time job, he was out every night this week with his ice cream truck, ding, 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 ding. He says, Dad, you can't believe this. And, and, and I totally, totally respect him for that. Not sitting back just because he can, but recognizing that hard work, earn it honestly, utilize it effectively. We spent a whole week on that. Shrewdness, astute, sharp, piercing, keen in practical matters. That's what shrewdness is. Astute, sharp, piercing, keen in practical matters. Shrewdness is the biblical answer to the Christian problem of being so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. You're to be shrewd. God wants you to be shrewd. That's what Luke, Luke 16 is all about. Oh, I don't know, I'm, I'm just not seeing it right. And about you, Jesus said that the sons of this world are more shrewd than the sons of light. Shrewdness. Stop. You say, well, I just don't see Jesus being... Look, stop confusing the behavior ethic of Jesus with the business ethic of Jesus. Please. All right? If he was your boss, trust me on this, you'd show up to work on time. If Jesus Christ was your boss, you'd put in a full day's work for a day's pay, or you'd hear about it fast. Well, that's not very loving. It's truthful. You don't help people by depriving of the truth. He wouldn't be mean. He wouldn't be harsh. He would be fair. But he's not playing games. Shrewdness. God sees it in heaven. He rewards it. Stop, listen, stop wasting. Stop rationalizing. Utilize money effectively. But I can't. I can't. I, I want things. I, I need. I need things. This will help. Give it generously. Generosity breaks bondage to money. It flat out tears the chains off your ankles and wrists. Generosity breaks bond. You say, well, I've never, we've always spent more than we made. Right. The way you knock those shackles off your hands and feet, your addiction to having, is give generously. Once you start giving generously, you're already saying the best thing isn't acquisition. So give it generously. Uh, this is important teaching. Tithing is the on-ramp to biblical generosity. It's not, it's not where you end up, it's where you start. I would be ashamed if I was only tithing at this stage of life. But it's where you start. You know, well, I just don't know where to start. Start there. That's a lot. 90% with you and God is more than 100% with you on your own. Bring the tithes into the storehouse, the place of worship, as we were just so privileged to do. That there be, may be food enough in my house declares the Lord in Malachi 3, and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing for you that you can't contain. Come, test me in this, God says. Test me in this. You say, well, I don't know about, I don't know about, about bringing it to, to church. Really? Really? <laughs> Honestly, all right, all right, all right. On all of our campuses right now, not just here where I can see you, but in Elgin and Aurora and in Crystal Lake and in, at the cathedral and in Niles and on the North Shore, First, if you were saved at Harvest Bible Chapel, I want you to stand. Go ahead, just stand up if you were saved in this church. All right, look around. 
Look around. Wow. Now, if you were baptized in this church, remain standing. Remain standing. If you were baptized in this church, just go ahead. Stand up if you were baptized here in this church. All right. If you rededicated your life to Jesus Christ here at Harvest Bible Chapel, stand up. Stand up if you made that decision. All right. Now, join those who are standing. If you were married, made a big decision, found a godly life partner, married here at Harvest, stand up if that's you, if you were married here. Come on. Remain standing. Just stand up, all right? Now, if you were in the first small group Bible study you've ever been part of at this church, I was in a deep, satisfying discipleship small group. Stand up if that's you. I never had that before. Not like that. All right, now look around. Look around. Go ahead, be seated, and add to that the messages that go out from this church are heard by uh, Arbitron, not what I say. Arbitron is the uh, Nielsen rating uh, of radio. And Arbitron says that more than three million people listen to the teaching from this church every week. Uh, not to change the fact, we had uh, this weekend on Friday night one of the most awesome worship experiences I've ever had. And the worship leaders in this church are writing songs now that are giving voice to praise among the followers of Jesus Christ around the world. And, and this church has planted a hundred church. 80 to 85 percent of all churches in North America have plateaued or are in decline. And while 85 percent of the churches are this or this, this church has, by God's, everyone say, by God's grace. This church, by God's grace, has planted a hundred more churches around the world. Now listen up. If you can find a better, a better storehouse to bring your tithe to, get it over there. All right. But you have a master who demands a return on his investment. And he expects not just that you would give faithfully, but that you would sow your gifts into a place where multiplication is taken seriously. In fact, notice that utilize it effectively, give it generously and multiply it faithfully, multiply it faithfully. It's got to be multiplied. We don't teach Jesus economic practice. We practice Jesus economic teaching. We, we don't, you know, circulate in Palatine with 12 disciples, not 13 or 11. And, 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 and then, uh, you know, uh, make sure half of them are fishermen and, and do the best miracles you can. We don't, we don't do that. Turn to your neighbor and say, we don't do that. Uh, Jesus, when he was short of money, got it out of a fish's mouth. You can be on his program when you can do that. All right? So why don't you don't think we should have any savings? Because if God wants us to have savings, you know, he'll just, he'll just provide. Really? Really? I hope you're good at fishing. <laughs> you're expected to multiply. Multiply. We studied uh, Matthew 25. The guy who had, uh, um, you go from minas to talents to cities. Or you go from fearful forfeiting to hoarding and squandering, and you get called in the end a wicked, lazy servant. All right? He expects a return, and he's not kidding around. Multiply it faithfully. Now some new content for the rest of the message. You with me? Love you. Telling you the truth. View it vertically, earn it honestly, utilize it effectively, give it generously, and multiply it faithfully. Finally, now, pulling two things together, enjoy it carefully or it will destroy you. Enjoy it carefully, carefully, or it will destroy you. Notice in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, he says, as for the rich in this present age... Um, a lot of those who are rich are in for a big surprise because they haven't been rich toward God. They haven't lived lives of generosity. And that's why he says, as for the rich in this present age, some people are going to be rolling in it in eternity who had nothing here. And some people who had a lot here are going to have nothing in eternity. And says, let me just be very clear who I'm talking about. First Timothy 6, 17, as for the rich in this present age, charge them... That's you. Most of us are wealthy by both world and historic standards. Charge them not to be haughty, not to be proud, not to be puffed up, not to be inflated. Love that. 
nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Ron Blue told us that the only uh, certainty about economics is uncertainty. That's the certainty, that there will be seasons of uncertainty. So don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on, what's it say? Look at the text, but on. Lift up your voice. Don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on. On God who richly provides us with everything uh, to enjoy. Is that really in the Bible? To enjoy? Okay, it's not what you'd expect him to say. He says, but on God, I expected him to say, who is the greatest treasure we could ever experience. Don't set your hopes on riches, set your hopes on God. He's the greatest treasure. Set your hopes on, which would be true, set your hopes on God who is better than any earthly thing. Paul said, the things that I had I counted as loss for the excellency of of the knowledge of Christ for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and consider it rubbish that I may gain Christ. And that's Philippians 3, 8. So I was really surprised by this passage. Look at it again. Don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. I really thought it would say, who is more awesome than anything you could have, but that isn't what it says. Set your hopes on God who richly, that means abundantly, generously, provides us with everything to enjoy. Now, listen up. It's not wrong to have things, it's wrong when things have you. And it's not wrong to enjoy, it's wrong, This is important. It's not wrong to enjoy. It's wrong to forget where enjoyment comes from. It's not wrong to enjoy something. It's not wrong to enjoy life's simple pleasures. It's not wrong to be blessed and satisfied by what God provides. I just have a kind of a problem, and I'm going to show it to you in the text in a moment, this sort of anti-enjoyment, only God, only God. You can't enjoy a walk on the beach, you can't enjoy a nice meal, you can't enjoy a pair of shoes, you can't enjoy anything, only God. Yes, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you, O God. There is a place and emptiness in each of us that only God can satisfy. That's Psalm 42, 1. But also, marvelous are your works, O Lord, and that my soul knows very well. The psalmist had joy in God and in his works. Psalm 139, verse 14. Yes, My delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law I meditate day and night, Psalm 1-2. But also, you have made me glad by your works, and at the work of your hands I sing for joy. Psalm 92, verse 4. Yes, Psalm 63, 1 says, O God, you are my God, and earnestly I seek you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water, my soul pants for you, God. Absolutely, 100%. The ultimate, the highest, the most is God. But reductionism is where you make the main thing the only thing. And Christians are famous for it. You take one thing and you make it everything the only thing. And that's how you get uh, into error. Psalm 111 verse 2 also says... Great are your works, studied by all who delight in them. Psalm chapter 8, verse 1 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. But then verse 3 says, When I look at the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? See, it, it, I just, I don't know how to say it any clearer. You read the Psalms yourself. It's the person of God and the works of God. Joy in God for who he is, the highest, the best, the most. Everybody say the most. The most. But not the only. Yes, joy and satisfaction in the good gifts of God. James says, every good and perfect gift comes from above. And you should be able to take a bite, maybe two, 
of a luscious piece of chocolate cake, and that should induce worship in you to the God who made you to be able to enjoy something. It shouldn't be like separate. Oh, that's earthly and bad and, and evil and, oh, God. I'm going to say more about this. Some of you might say, I don't know. Is it really worth it? There's so much danger. Things can have our hearts. Why press up against the edge? We might go over. The physical is just temporal. The physical is, is dangerous. The physical is evil. Uh, that's, listen, that's the road to asceticism right there. That's asceticism. I don't know if you know that word. You need to know it. Uh, turn back to the left a little bit and go to Colossians where Paul confronts that error. Colossians chapter 2. Jot this down. Too little enjoyment is asceticism. Some of you are aspiring ascetics. You don't have any fun. Man, I'm so weary of cheerless Christians who don't know how to have any fun at all. Man, shake yourself loose. Have a little fun. Too little enjoyment is asceticism. Here's what the word means, asceticism. A-S-C-E-T-I-C-I-S-M. A, a belief in rigorous self-denial and suppression of all physical satisfaction. Who would do that? A lot of people. A belief in rigorous self-denial and suppression of physical satisfaction. Why? To gain God's favor and to heighten the enjoyment of God's fellowship. Nothing physical to be enjoyed to heighten the delight of God. That's asceticism. And Paul confronts it right here in Colossians chapter 2. Look at verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to festival. Or They're like, you can't drink that. You can't eat that. Christians don't eat that. Christians don't drink stuff like that. We don't celebrate Halloween. That's not the right time for Easter. That's not the right day of the week to worship. Don't let anybody pass judgment on you in these matters. Look at verse 17. These are a shadow of things to come. The substance belongs to Christ. Right. Underline that in your neighbor's Bible. <laughs> the substance belongs to Christ. Christianity is a personal faith, love, relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not a building, it's not songs, it's not rules, it's a relationship. And relationships don't work good if they're run by rules. My wife and I, early on in our marriage, we had the rules for fair fighting. And that's good, and, and you probably need that when you're starting out, but we've found through the years that love has trumped the need for those rules, all right? You grow in love relationship with God. now. Some people take this to the extreme and their antinomianism. There's no rules. God has prescribed a way for us to live. What Paul's saying is, don't let anybody judge you by adding extra stuff to the book. The substance belongs to Christ. Verse 18. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on, huh, that's a biblical word, asceticism and worship of angels. Going on in detail about visions. Oh, I have seen. Oh, I have seen the things I have seen. The dreams I have had. The visions that I have had. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism, worship of angels, going on in details about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. The person who's like, all God, all God, all God, all God, has a sensuous mind. He says no to sexuality. He says no to physical anything. No pleasure for the body. The body is evil. That's asceticism. 
Just God, just God, just God. And the Holy Spirit of God says, you have a sensuous mind. Not holding fast to the head. There it is again, verse 17, the substance belongs to Christ. Not hold, underline that in your neighbor's Bible, verse 19. Not holding fast to the head. Who's the head? Tell me, loved ones. Christ. Who's the head? Jesus you must be excited to say it. Have you talked yet during this sermon? Who's the head? Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the head. Amen. The substance is Christ. Hold fast to the head. From whom the whole body, that's us, me and you, nourished by Christ, knit together by Christ, grows with a growth that is from God. So, verse 20, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of this world, why as if they were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? He's writing to people who had an old religious way. Do not handle, do not taste. Christians don't do that. We don't smoke, we don't chew, we don't go with girls that do. <laughs> I'm not for any of those things particularly, but it's the focus on the rule. The filthy five. I'm a Christian because of five things I don't, because of 12 things, a dirty dozen. Man, you're following Jesus is 12 things you don't do. I grew up with that. But you don't have a love relationship with Jesus. You're not passionately following him and looking for the next signal. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they're used. As though following Jesus was about stuff in your fridge. According to human precepts and teaching, stuff people made up. Not in the Bible, yo. Stuff people made up. Christians don't drive that, if you want to talk finances. Christians don't drive that. Christians don't wear that. Christians don't live there. Referring to things that all perish as they're used according to the human precepts and teaching. Here it is. These indeed have the appearance of wisdom. In other words, it makes sense in a worldly kind of way. It makes sense, seems smart. Someone says, you know, don't do, if you really want to be serious, you know, here's this diet you need to follow. Here's this budget you need to have. This is, this is how much you can spend and no more. Anything more than this is not Christ-like. We are going to answer for it. And it's as serious as serious gets. I already told you that. But if God wanted to give us a budget, it would be in the Bible. How many people think he could have got that written down? All right. He wants you to wrestle with it. He wants you to feel the weight of making wise decisions and ultimate accountability to him for everything that he's given to you. That's why it's not prescribed. That's why we can't get up in each other's grill about everything. God wants you to feel the weight of it yourself. I feel it. You feel it? Yeah. It's a weight. To whom much is given, much is required. These indeed have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion. Well, there's that word again. And asceticism, severity to the body. Severity to the body. That's, that's no party, no fun, no enjoyment, no party, no fun, no enjoyment. Why? People are going to hell. Yeah, and, and when they spend time with you, they feel like they've already been there. That's not Christianity. That's not Christianity. Severity to the body. Here's, look, look up here, loved ones. The verse finishes, but they are of no value in the indulgence of the flesh. It doesn't help. It doesn't help, okay? The guy who's a eunuch is still lusting. The guy who got physical castration is still battling lust in his mind, okay? The, the person who says 500 calories a day, no more, no more, is thinking about food all the time. That's, 
It, these, these rules are of no value. The, the aesthetic is still longing for a good meal or a nice pair of shoes, even as he congratulates himself on his self-denial. I have a ministry friend. I went to his house. It was so cold inside. Dude, it's cold in here. What's the temperature? Oh, it's 60 degrees. Then I noticed he was wrapped in a blanket. It's like, what are you in a blanket for? Well, I'm trying to be a good steward. <laughs> that is foolishness. It's foolishness. And when he almost had a nervous breakdown, I had to send him a gift because he didn't even have any money to take his wife out of town and try to get the train back on the tracks again. That's awful stewardship. It's not spiritual, is what I'm trying to say. It's not stewardship. It's not spiritual. It's not biblical. It's not honoring to Christ. And it's not new. Anybody heard of Bernard of Clairvaux? Yeah. Bernard of Clairvaux, he lived uh, 1090 to 1153. He wrote some beautiful hymns, Jesus, the very thought of thee, O sacred head now wounded. But Bernard of Clairvaux was an ascetic. Here's what he said, this is a quote. More remote from man, nearer to God. Holiness measured by suffering. All human sympathies, all social feelings, all tides to kindred, which means family, all affections are to be torn up by the roots for the groaning spirit. Pain and prayer, prayer and pain were to be the soul, uh, were to be the soul stirring, unwearying occupations of a saintly life. Ah! Incorrect. I do not want to go out for pizza with him. <laughs> These are of no value in defeating the indulgence of the flesh. They're of no value. It's not helpful. Now, if you're listening carefully and your spirit is sensitive, um, you should be saying, so this is the danger then, James? This is the danger? Asceticism? Well, it's a danger for sure. If you can't enjoy what God calls clean. Acts chapter 10, Peter got reamed out for this. He's like, I don't eat that. I don't eat that. God brings it all down a blanket. Oh, unclean. I don't unclean that. And the message comes, don't call unclean what God calls clean. He's given us all things richly to enjoy. Asceticism is a danger for sure. You can't enjoy what God calls clean. You judge everyone who does as guilty of desires that you battle. You're not better off for that, you're worse off. But, but, everyone say it. But. but in 2013 in North America, that is a smaller danger. That is a smaller danger. The great danger in 2013 in North America is not asceticism, though it's more broadly distributed than some realize. The greater danger, everyone say by far, by far. is not asceticism, but materialism. And that's why we're in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Too little enjoyment is asceticism. Jot this down, too much enjoyment is materialism. Too much enjoyment. Psalm 62, I quote it frequently. It's my favorite psalm. Uh, Pour out your hearts to God and so on. Also in Psalm 62, if riches increase, do not set your heart upon them. Now this is why, again, look up here just for a second so I can make a little eye contact. Uh, this is why um, I, I talk to some of the church's leaders and this is why I combined the two messages. Because I can't teach on righteous enjoyment as I just did without bringing the danger in. I just can't make those separate messages. Everywhere you see a little bit in the Bible, and it's in a lot of places about righteous enjoyment, but always right with it is, but be careful, be careful, be careful. It's a pretty narrow place. And, and, and people uh, run to asceticism because they're fearful uh, of the dangers of righteous enjoyment, and, and there are uh, real uh, dangers. So that's why I wanted to put these together in one message, and that's why we're in 1 Timothy 6. Look uh, with me at verse 9, where it says, but those who, 
want to be rich or desire to be rich. Um, I just wrote want in my Bible because we don't use the word desire this way. Uh, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. As people are tempted to, as people were tempted to focus on what's visible. Um, he has too much. He's lazy. All she cares about is appearance. We tend, we tend to focus on what we can see and fall into judgment. But what the Bible is concerned about is not so much even what you have, but where your heart is, where your heart is. The Bible is always focusing on the desire level. We judge one another at the decision level, but the Bible always brings it back to desire. And here a desire is condemned. Those who desire to be rich fall. Underline that in your Bible, fall. Continuously they fall. They set their heart on being rich and they're always falling, always grasping, always reaching. The danger is great. Notice they fall into temptation and a snare. It's the idea of a trap. I see the cheese, it looks attractive, snap! And that's, that's temptation and snare, temptation and snare. Now, money is a great temptation. If you're struggling to make ends meet, if you can hardly pay the rent, that is a great trial. And I pray that this series will help you get to a better place. If you have more than you need, with that comes temptation. I can afford a movie, which one should I watch? I can afford a vacation, where should I go? I can afford an entertainment, what should I choose? And, and, and there are, is a river of temptation that flows into our life through uh, excess uh, resource. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, 1 Timothy 6. Verse 9, notice he keeps going here. It's quite a ladder down. Temptation snare, many senseless and harmful desires. So look up here. The, the, the drawer is wanting to be rich. In the drawer is a lot of files. Because if I'm rich, I can, and I can, and I will, and I can, and I could, and I would, and I, I hope to, and I can't wait to, and I'm looking forward to. The drawer is filled with files labeled stuff I could have if I was rich. Close the drawer, label, I want to be rich. That's this verse. And if you want to be rich, you fall into temptation to snare many senseless and senseless, foolish, harmful desires. Why, 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 why are they so harmful? They plunge people into ruin and destruction. Feel, feel the weight, loved ones. You just don't want to soften or harden God's word. Just let the Spirit of God, let those words settle on you. The desire to be rich plunges people into many senseless and harmful desires into ruin and destruction. Why? What's, what's, what's the big deal, really? What's the big deal? Verse 10. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Notice, a please, would you, that it's the love of money. That's one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. Your mama probably always said to you, money, you know, you know, money's the root of all evil. Incorrect. Money is a tool. It's what you do with it, okay? Money's not the problem. Uh, loving money is. You're like, well, that, that seems a little elusive. Um, um, right. And so I want to just take the four things that Dave Ramsey said and just develop them a little bit. 
I jot these five things down. You know you love money when? Remember in Luke 16 where they got all over Jesus when he told the parable on shrewdness? It says right in the, at the end of that, he said they did that because they loved money. Do you love money? I don't know. I don't know. All right. He, he started, the list was good. You know you love money when, uh, number one, when you're tempted by get-rich-quick schemes. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand, but uh, I wonder how many people with this crazy Powerball thing going on, how many people went and bought a ticket that didn't buy one any other time? It was just so big, I mean, I mean, I had to buy one ticket. I, normally, I never do, but I had to this. You got tempted. I'm just telling you. One in 200, you have a better chance statistically of becoming president. <laughs> a tough job. You know you love many money when you're tempted by getting rich quick. You know you love money when you're desperate to appear wealthy. I just want people to see what I'm, do you see what I'm sporting here? Do you have any idea that this is not regular fare? Do you, do you, I don't know if you've like checked this out. Bling, bling. I gave my wife a nice ring to replace the one that I bought her for a couple of hundred dollars when we got married and that was precious and she's saving that but when our first son graduated from high school and it was our 20th anniversary. I bought her a nicer ring and she can enjoy that and I, that's not wrong. I would, don't tell me that that's wrong. I don't believe that's wrong. But you know, um, uh, but if you're like, check me out, check me out, check me out. <laughs> and, and if you're like, you know, if you want people to think that you're like just more and if you think that that means you're better and that people should be, and why don't you, why don't you, Bear some fruit for the glory of Jesus Christ and give it all to him and die to what people think about you. Just have the funeral for that. How much pain is caused by what do they think? How do I appear? How am I coming across? You know you love many when you're desperate to appear like you have more than you have. Here's one, when you have anxiety about what you don't have. I can't believe they can dress their kids like that. I can't believe they can afford for their kids to go there. And, and I can't believe that you have anxiety about what you don't have. It's interesting, as our ministry has uh, grown outside of Harvest, I've been privileged to meet uh, just all kinds of different people, one family that I know very well. Um, interesting, they owned a castle in England worth $25 million dollars. I go, oh, well, they're, they're materialistic for sure. I'm actually, interestingly, they uh, sold it at the right time and took all the money and used it all to build a church. I, I'm, just, I'm just here to tell you that it isn't, well, those who have more, they, they're really under it. And those who have, sometimes the people with the most are the most materialistic, and sometimes the people with the least think that having the most is the most Anxiety about what you don't have, that's the love of money. Oh, and then this, jealousy of what others have. That's what Dave Ramsey said. You're, you're just like, well, why did, why did, why did, and that leads real quickly to judging uh, people, judging others, and, and uh, uh, just judging people. Well, I think that she, God knows why people do what they do. You can't see people's hearts. Well, how'd they get it, and, and they don't need it, and it's not wise, and, and, and we'll just start here. Are you ready to account to Jesus Christ for what he's given you? Because I don't think probably uh, Bill and Sheila, they're probably not even going to be there when you're answering for what you have. So I put my focus there if I were you. Um, this is a big danger. You say, well, how do you get out of that? Here's the last thing. Godliness plus contentment is great gain. Godliness plus contentment. He says, verse 6. Oh, I wanted to finish. Forgive me, verse 10. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving. What a picture. That some have wandered away from the faith. I don't want to give. I don't want to be challenged. I'm out of here. I don't need this. And, and, 
and someone pushed on your idolatry and it's so sore, wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves through. The translation I memorized says, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It's the idea of, 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 of uh, stabbing yourself with pain. The desire to be rich, the love of money. God help us all. Here's the solution. Godliness plus contentment is great gain. Verse 6, now there is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of it. Isn't that a great picture? Yeah. What'd you come in with? Nothing. Actually have a birth picture of Pastor Rick before he was even dressed. Here's a naked picture of Pastor Rick. Check this out. No, I would not do that. <laughs> I would not, I would not do that. To, I, if I could have found the picture, I might have done it. But, <laughs> but uh, I'm just trying to bring to your mind the picture that's in the scriptures. What'd you, hold up, what'd you come in with? Right, now hold, what are you leaving with? Nothing, nothing, right? One of my favorite stories is of the seminary professor or seminary student who had never preached a sermon before, but he got his first chance. He was going to preach a funeral sermon, but he didn't have a suit. So he didn't have any money. So seminary students, you know, broke and... And so he, he went to a pawn shop. Couldn't believe he walked in the pawn shop. There was racks of suits, racks of them. What? How, how can we have so many suits here? The guy says, oh, he says, a funeral home uh, down the street went bankrupt. He says, we got all the suits they used to bury people in. We got them all. So the guy says, great, you know, 20 bucks. He takes a suit, he puts it on. He's up preaching his very first sermon at a funeral. <laughs> he, he's not getting very much traction. You know, he's young. He just can't, can't kind of get it going. So he puts his hands in his pockets like this. And all of a sudden, his hand goes, hand goes right down his pockets. And, and he's like, there's no pockets in the suit. <laughs> of course there's no pockets, he thought to himself. I'm wearing a suit for dead guys. <laughs> then he started preaching on that. <laughs> all right. right? See? Of course there's no pockets. Clothes made for dead people don't need pockets. You brought nothing into this world. You're taking nothing out. So you say, how do you get to contentment, James? How do you get there? Think about eternity. You think about eternity every day. This will be over soon. I'm going to answer to Jesus Christ. He expects a return on his investment. Look to eternity. And then notice this, let enough be enough. If we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. With these we will be content. John D. Rockefeller was asked, how much uh, is enough? He said, just a little bit more. He said at the end of his life, I've made my millions. They've brought me no happiness. Cornelius Vanderbilt said, the care of millions is a great load. I have no pleasure in it. John Jacob Astor, immensely wealthy said, I am the most miserable man on earth. Henry Ford said, at the end of his life, I was happiest doing mechanics work. I got thinking about enjoyment this week. I think my favorite, favorite thing is having a barbecue with friends or family. When Kathy and I first got married, her uh, dad gave us a little orange. Uh, her dad's been in heaven since, in eternity since 1990. And he gave us this little uh, orange electric uh, barbecue. And uh, we used to go to our little balcony apartment and, and I can remember having friends over. This, is, this was like, this was a pathetic barbecue, okay? It was awful. But I have such great memories of these first, when we were first married. And then uh, I think after a while I got a hibachi, you know, one of those little kind of, remember those hibachi things? We put the charcoal in it and that seemed like kind of an upgrade. And then Maybe about 15 or so years ago, living here in Chicago, I got a Weber grill. I was styling, baby. I was styling. <laughs> and then last, uh, maybe, a, a, maybe I think a, two summers ago, I got my first, you know, midlife crisis man-sized barbecue. <laughs> and this spring, um, I turned the gas on it. Didn't work. <laughs> Had to call somebody. You know, I kind of still wish I had that orange barbecue that Kathy's dad gave us. And, and I can honestly tell you, and maybe you've seen this, I just don't think that things increase happiness. 
And if you're spending what you have on things that disintegrate, that don't appreciate, that you're not going to be able to show a return to your master for, you better be getting some enjoyment out of that. Contentment is the enjoyment of things that last, the enjoyment of things that matter, the resting in what I have, the realization of eternity, the readiness to let enough uh, be enough. Watch this uh, closing video and start thinking about the remaining diagnostics. We want you to get this done and tie it all together. It seems right like that subject is so uh, subjective. That whole topic of contentment is so subjective. Um, how do you know when you're content? Are you content? You know I am, but I'm not content 100% of the time, but there are indicators of when I'm not content. Oh, I'd love to hear those. And um, I do think that what Dave, David Jeremiah said about contentment is no regrets of the past. Now, I've made a lot of mistakes in the past, and I can find myself sitting in a stoplight saying, you idiot. Yeah, why did I do that? Why did I do that? It was a, it was a stupid mistake. But I also know the answer to that, and that's mm -hmm. what God wants me to do is I've got that all under control. The other thing is uh, no fear of the future. And that's a really big one. So I can examine my heart and ask myself the question, am I afraid of what's going to happen? Am I putting so much confidence in my money, uh, trying to protect myself? That's an indicator. And it'll always be a battle. And I think there's some other uh, things. Uh, for example, uh, giving generously. You know, I, I haven't seen anybody that's content that's not giving generously. Mm -hmm. And I have found my contentment level went up the more I gave. Yeah, isn't that right? Uh, because all of a sudden I'm getting it into perspective and I didn't realize I was holding on to some things. I like to think every day I get up with the sword of generosity mm. and slay the dragon mm -hmm. of materialism yeah. in my life. And he's alive again the next day, isn't he? Absolutely. Yeah, that's... I think husband and wife uh, communication is a really big one. You know, uh, Judy says to me, she says, don't put my life on a spreadsheet. <laughs> Boy, I'm sure every accountant-minded guy's heard that one, right, Brian? Do you get that? Yep, 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 yep. But what she's saying is, you know, I think differently. I feel differently. Yeah. Listen to me. Yeah. And uh, and it's take it. I mean, that's a battle with me. Yeah. Um, and it's a battle with her. And this is why doesn't this idiot understand? Yeah. Um, and I, I love think, that. Don't want to be content if my spouse isn't content. It's, no. a, it's a partnership restfulness. Absolutely. And I have learned so much uh, from my wife, uh, and not about money, but about an attitude towards money mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. that's been really, really helpful. She's very generous, mm -hmm. very generous. And, and I've been more the, yeah. let's hold on to this a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so she's helped me a lot. And I think the, the last thing, or another thing, is godly counsel. And I think uh, you'll never get the right answer unless you ask the right question. Okay. And I can't always ask myself the right question. That's good. So I, uh, years ago at uh, my, my company, I required that everybody that was giving financial advice would have a financial advisor. Come myself on. Myself included. Nope, nope, you don't have Do you have one? Continues to this day. Yep. Mm -hmm. You both have financial advisors. Yeah, I mean, I've written 20 books on finances, and I have a financial planner. Well, that should settle it for everybody listening, right? If they have them, we better have them. I'm, I got this guy right here. So, I mean, everybody needs one, right? They do. And it's not because I don't understand finances, but it comes back to this. I can't for sure ask myself the right question, one. And two, I may not be able to get the right answer out of Judy. Right. Whereas he can turn to her and say, what do you think about that? Give me an example of a question that I might not ask myself easily, that an advisor would ask me. What are your lifestyle desires? What do you think it is that's going to make you content? What do you have to have? Priorities. Priorities. And then why? Right. Okay. And it might be a vacation. It might be uh, a piece of clothing. Uh, mm -hmm. It might be several things. But Not to make me feel guilty about those things, but to help me no. put them in their proper place. Yeah. And I feel better about myself if I'm making godly decisions and somebody else can help me make a godly decision. Well, my financial advisor has been a great blessing to me mm -hmm. and some of the people and, and uh, tools that he's brought to bear upon Kathy and I's thinking. And uh, one of the great things that Brian's done to serve uh, this uh, teaching God's money is, is he's worked really hard to develop these diagnostics. And uh, the last one's pretty important, Brian. So. It is. We're wrapping up with a, basically a summary of all the diagnostics that you've been working on so far. You've got your financial testimony, and that'll continue to be, I'm sure, very valuable to you. Um, but from the following week, you should have six diagnostics, including that first one, to summarize on this diagnostic score sheet 
uh, that you'll work through this week. And so each one of those you'll take and record your answers on this final diagnostic score sheet and add total those up. Score sheet, score sheet. Is this going to feel like a report card? Yeah, well, <laughs> not, maybe not that stringent, but um, what it's going to do is enable you to get pointed in the right direction as to some next steps. And there'll be a scale at the bottom from 0 to 100. And depending on where you fall on that, there'll be some real clear directives on whether you need help right away or just some more teaching and education on it, or maybe you need to move more into some of the more complex applications. Well, you know, it's never fun to go to the dentist, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but the reality is, is uh, I don't know if you've ever sat in a dentist chair when he's like, if you had been here a year ago, this would have been better. <laughs> and, you know, we love our people, and we don't want to withhold from them out of some uh, immediate comfort. We want to push uh, all of those who are getting this teaching into a rigorous analysis of where I'm at. The sooner you get the news, uh, the sooner you're going to be able to make progress on it. And that's, is that what this is going to do for us? Absolutely. And I've been so encouraged, James, by the, just the stories I'm hearing of how it's been applied in the community groups. And people are really taking this seriously. And so I, I'm excited about the value it's going to be bringing to each individual and family. Well, I just want to say, uh, first of all, as someone who I would have had no right to request your humble involvement, the time you've put into making the diagnostics, the effort that you've uh, invested in my life personally and now in our church. I just want to really thank you in front of everybody. And uh, joy. yeah, well, it really has been a blessing. And, and Ron, I mean, honestly, the uh, I know you love it when I call you the grandfather of Christian <laughs> yeah. finance, but uh, it, you have it. I mean, mm -hmm. you just really have that you've given your life to this. You mm -hmm. share. You're not just generous with your resources. You're generous with what God's taught you. And you've been generous with us. And so I just wanted to thank you well, I'm also. I'm a blessed man, James, yeah. just to be able to participate. Thank you for asking me. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. And uh, we're going to commit these matters to prayer. The series God's Money is Over, but your work is just beginning. Uh, let's not just be hearers of the word, but let's be doers of what it says. That's where the freedom is. That's where the victory is. And that's when the joy really comes our way. Great. Let's all stand together. And uh, let me just say that uh, we're very hopeful that you'll follow through on this. Don't deceive yourself into thinking that hearing the word is an end in itself. You have to put it into practice. Now, this has been a carefully studied, biblical, balanced instruction on God's money. View it vertically, gain it honestly, utilize it effectively, give it generously, multiply it faithfully, uh, enjoy it carefully, or it will destroy you. It's about as serious as serious gets. Christ gives us the strength to do that. Let's close with a prayer. Jacob, let's close with a prayer. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. Take my life and let it be consecrated. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my silver and my gold, not of my would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as that you my church in my church Lord be glorified be glorified in my church Lord be glorified today. just in my life just in my life sing that in my Amen, amen. Well, I'm kind of excited to get my sticker on again. And uh, we are available to pray for you. We are challenging you over the course of this summer. I want everybody who has a sticker on, just uh, you can leave now. And uh, easy exit to the lobby. Go as quickly as you can. Uh, spread around on all of our campuses. And uh, these are people here who love the Lord and love you. Uh, we didn't randomly place those stickers. There are certainly lots of other people here who could pray for you. 
uh, but we uh, commend to you the prayer ministry of these people, and we're encouraging you maybe not to leave church even any week uh, this summer without coming up to someone. I'm going to be out there too and just saying, hey, can you pray? Can you just pray for me about this, and let's be taking our needs before the Lord. Father, we commit our lives and our church to you. We commit all that we have to you. We commit all that we are to you. We commit our futures to you. I pray that you would give repentance to those who need to turn from sinful neglect and wasting and foolishness. I pray for a diligence for those who are facing tough decisions about getting out of debt. I pray for perseverance for those who have uh, begun to live a life of generosity. And, and I pray for faith for those who are uh, trusting you and, 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 and putting you to the test uh, this summer. I pray for faith for those who are uh, giving the tithe and, and waiting to see your uh, provision. Thank you that you are able to make all grace abound toward us. And so we uh, commit these things to you. Pray that we be diligent in their application in our lives for your glory. In the name of Jesus, the church said, amen, amen. amen. You are loved.